before and after. Uh, Abdur, my name is Abdurrahman Sharif, and I work with an organization called the Muslim Charities Forum, a network of uh, Islamic NGOs that work in this country. And I just wanted to echo what Dominic and uh, Abdul Rashid said. Uh, for us, we've been facing the same issues. If you look at the FATF, this is the main body that needs to be addressed. Yes? It's an international regulator, the UK, the US, another government, 27, I think, governments sit on it. Uh, and in their uh, recommendations, they said, there are two uh, areas that they see as vulnerable. One is the money remitters, and the others are the charities. And you can see, for example, in Somalia, uh, where a lot of organizations work, is that their space of operation is very, very much reduced. Mm. There could be much aid, much more aid going into that country. But people are scared, right? Because they're seen as vulnerable, negative, and things like that. Yeah. And uh, one thing I didn't want to say before is when Rushnara said, actually, that the NGOs didn't campaign. It's wrong, yeah. right? They did something behind the scenes. They didn't want to speak out loud. And I spoke to some of the agencies because I sit, uh, I'm co-chair of uh, the Somalia Advocacy Group who is uh, a number of agencies mm. that work in Somalia. And the reason is simple. If I'm an agency and I say publicly, I work in Somalia, Barclays or another bank will look at me and tomorrow will close my account. Yeah. Simple, okay? okay. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, uh, and there are ways around it. Sorry, I was speedy. There are ways around it, okay? The US, for instance, introduced licensing systems, right, to enable agencies, organizations to work mm -hmm. and operate in certain areas. And that could be a way forward. But there is, yes, uh, everybody is saying there is a risk, there is a risk, there is a risk. But to date, money remitters or charities have seen no evidence of actually them committing any crime or, or, or such ever. And when, even when we ask authorities or regulators, give us the examples, they say, well, it's actually a secret. We can't see it. Okay. But it's we have evidence depressing. that it's there. Okay. Thank you very much. Please. And then I've got a couple of questions that, you know, we've asked people to, uh, to get in touch if they have questions to ask because they're watching, the, the, uh, watching as we go along. And I have a couple of questions after yours and then we'll... Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like, you mentioned look ahead to the future. And we talk a lot about more competition, more transparency, and I would like to challenge this view. I would like to talk about the elephant in the room, that is financial repression. We have a big body of literature talking about financialization. Financialization puts the focus on the role of finance and the role of finance turning the core of their business to the workers, to households, to individuals, in relation to, to, and one of the things that says is our finance is financially expropriating workers, taking fees out of wages. This in relation to credit, but also in relation to monetary services. Money transfer is a fundamental money um, financial service. So I wonder whether we should think about having caps. Mr. Dilop Rada mentioned that 1% is too much. 5% is too much because with the current level of technology, it's very, very cheap to, to send back the money. So I wonder whether we should uh, think broadly. We should challenge the view that uh, more finance is good. There are very bad finance. If you go to the, if you compare the profits of Western Union with the Fortune 500, you will see how profitable Western Union, MGR, um, and no, we please. need, oh, okay, so I just uh, would like to, 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 to say that actually we need to look to the question of uh, price repres repression and nationalized banks. If we have a, national, a nationalized bank with a public mandate to take care about money remittances, maybe the things could change and we could provide some funds for the development of Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question here for Nyakachi. Um, it's from Jackie Niaro. Uh, and sh um, she asks, is there room for di diaspora or porans participating in their remit aid concept? So um, that's a question to you. And the second question yes. is, is yes. more. Is, yes, the answer, Jackie, is yes. And, and so <laughs> that's good. I, like, I'm not going to encourage you to say any more. Uh, and then the second question is Leon Isaacs from Developing Markets Associates Limited. And this is a question for Selma. Can she share any indicative data on the growth rate of remittances into Kenya? Also, is he's got is twice. Is it correct that World Remit sends more to them from the UK rather than the, that rather than WU? 
I'm I can't comment on exact data, but um, yeah, I mean the 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 online the innovative MTOs are a significant uh, player in sending remittances to Kenya. Significant share, yeah. Okay, thank you. So it's a su successful proof of the model. <laughs> right, so successful <laughs> proof of the model. That's what we like to hear. Okay, thanks, Kevin. You want one to really quick observation and a really quick question. That you know, I, I was really struck by Abdul Rashid's presentation mm. because we didn't show this in the data, but the country that comes out with the lowest charges for remittance transfers in Africa is Somalia. Yeah, yeah. and it's basically because of the Habshil. Which I think tells us a lot about what we need to know about the role of competition and uh, low cost delivery. So, and that there is a terrible paradox in this that you know the the big thing that caused a regulatory chill was the HSBC prosecution. Mm. And I actually read the congressional inquiry into HSBC, which I'd really encourage people to read because it, it, it's almost like reading an unfolding horror story, <laughs> where you know you have lorry loads of cash mm. from known criminals. Mm. Um, you know, drugs cartels mm. taking vast amounts of money via HSBC into British Virgin Island and Cayman Island accounts, mm. bringing it back into the US with no due, di due, di due diligence at all. And Somalia is the country that pays the price for that, uh, that stuff. But, you know, it really strikes me that these regulatory issues are now so fundamental to development and financing in Africa that if we don't start treating them as core development concerns, you know, because you know, we keep focusing on financial transfers, getting economic policies right, but if we can't get the regulatory environment right, we're not going to solve the, these problems. And the, the, the quick questions to Selma is, you know, I think the M-Pesa story is an extraordinary one, actually. It's a really transformative story for, for Kenya. But interestingly, it, it's been, as I understand it, a, a little bit less successful in Tanzania. And where you've linked up with Western Union and MoneyGram, it hasn't really brought down the cost of remittance transfers significantly. No, well, I mean, yeah. no, maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, I just yeah, think it'd sure. be good to get you So, on. you know, we launched in many countries, and Kenya and Tanzania and South Africa were among the first ones. So Kenya is uh, the, the most famous success story. Tanzania is equally successful, in my opinion. It's just that uh, there you, it, it's, it's a more competitive market, different needs. Um, South Africa was probably not a biggest success. There are reasons for that. You know, sometimes you know I think the distribution was not set up as ambitiously as it should be to uh, to uh, actually to to provide access for the poor, which are our most loyal uh, customer base. So perhaps maybe those could be the reasons. In terms of uh, partnering with MTOs. Yes, you're right, it did not bring uh, cost of remittances down, partnering with Western Union, but that was our first step to associate m -Pesa with remittances. And as we partner with the rest of the small players and you know uh, the, the long tail of the small MTOs, that brings then significant yeah. competition mm. and you know, provokes those kind of promotions mm. from side of the, of the mm. big guys. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, can I just yes, make please. a comment there? Yes, I mean, I, we've obviously been talking about m -Pesa for a long time, and, and uh, it always features at these conferences. And I know it's it's, it's like the, the you know holy grail where everyone wants to go. But I think we need to get a bit of perspective. And I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm in no way um, demeaning or discouraging of, w of what's happening with m -Pesa, But in terms of a percentage of the actual volume a annually sent around the world, it's it's probably less than you know 0.5 percent. I mean, I'll, I'll be stand corrected, but I'm sure that's the, the reality. And the reality is what customers on the send and the receive side want at the moment is cash in and cash out. That's mm -hmm. overwhelmingly what customers want. Mm -hmm. And I, I do ho I do very much encourage policymakers not to get caught up in, in, in ideal worlds which are, are, are removed from what the consumers actually want because we just we just go down a big dead end otherwise. Just a, just a word of caution, really. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think whether we'll increase uh, the competition, uh, I welcome Ambassador. But Ambassador at the same time, uh, have their own exclusive system on Vodafone, the largest network in the world. You know, it, it is not um, it is not a system <laughs> open to everybody. You know, it is um, exclusively run by Mbesa, and um, and if you are in Kenya and you want to compete in Mbesa, and we have offices in Kenya, it, unless you become agents of Mbesa, 
it's not a free uh, how can you free platform to use mm. it so no. uh, one of the future things that will improve is to have uh, apps apps <laughs> is the answer and the internet connection is the answer over the top S solution yes mm. which is where also you have a banking mm. uh, system linked yeah, to it absolutely so uh, maybe Ambassador can work on that <laughs> and, and, and you know, to increase well, you know, the like spirit of competition. Yeah, different business you models, know, you, know, you know, to roll out Ambassador, you need to put CapEx in there, you need to, you know, three years of investment into distribution. With the help of UK wanna, government, yeah. with the help of UK government. I mean, the different was well, perhaps, the one yeah. who financed the whole Ambassador system. Mm -hmm. So we're asking different, I'm sure, I'm sure they're here one way or another. They <laughs> I think I think the cost <laughs> was cost was probably bigger. Yeah, I mean, if it can help, the same way they have helped with investors on this uh, mobile project. Yeah. yeah. But the key challenge, of course. <laughs> I'll take that question there, and then you can come in in case you want to uh, say something on this one as well. And then we do have to wind up, I think, because just one more then, because we're we're already quarter of an hour late, and we the next panel has to come in. Ah, from Washington. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, th where, where did I? Where was I? That you were next, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm from the Global Native. We're a small organisation based in Leeds, also working on remittances, and we work a lot through Africa UK and with the uh, Afford. Um, my question is a bit of a comment and a question, following on from what uh, Onye Kachu said. Um, earlier, about two weeks ago, I got a, a um, request from ODI, someone working from ODI. Um, asking if I know some people who would be interested in giving their personal stories about the cost of remittances um, and so forth. And I've put this through to some of the communities that I work with, and the response was quite surprising. The first issue was, why are they asking us to suddenly give this um, evidence and what are they trying to do with our stories, mm -hmm. what's in it for them, mm -hmm. and all of these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit that it struck me because I realized there is a lot being um, discussed about migrants and without migrants in it. Yeah. So my question was, having studied this research, uh, which I uh, commend ODI for doing, i um, quite curious as to the timing and do they foresee a partnership later on, perhaps with um, Defeat or other such organizations? And if so, are there any such plans to then roll this out, you know, so that uh, remittances can be dealt with in partnership with the, the migrants themselves. Thank you. Yeah, then this question that you have here. And then we, thanks. Yeah, this is a question from Sonia Plaza, who works with Dilip, and she was in the, in the, yeah. uh, in the video. Um, so to, to the MPESA lady, Samar, um, can you explain more about the regulatory constraints on international licenses in the sending and receiving model? And how does the new law of the Central Bank of Kenya affect mm. mobile remittances? Okay. No, you start if you start and then others? I think it's a pretty mm. complex question because, you know, we look at different regulatory environments and uh, all of them will be very specific, yeah? But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to comment specifically on Kenya. I mean, it's, it's really, really different stories in different markets. But what, what is in common to all of them is that uh, in some countries we want, you know, in order to it's just the legislation is not adapted for a big player like a telecom who doesn't have, um, you know, banking <laughs> characteristics to even to apply in some countries. Then in some countries, uh, the, the agents that we use for MPESA, simple shops in the village, you know, would never qualify as if remittance cash out agents because they are, there is increased regulation on how this branch should look like. <coughs> And then uh, another characteristic that would s we would see limiting is, is, is around the values. Yeah, we want to be able to apply our normal uh, identification of customer that we apply domestically for M-Pesa, you know, the, the know your customer requirements to the IMT as well because we are dealing with small amounts. Our, our values are, you know, limits in Kenya, I think, for tier one customer would be $700, yeah? So we would like that those rules are applied on international money transfer as well. So those would be the three characteristics. Thank you. Yeah, I <coughs> Dilip earlier on spoke about pushing people towards um, the banking system. 
and how important that was. But I also want to stress if we're really interested in the developmental um, dimensions of um, remittances, that it's very important mm -hmm. that we look at um, um, other um, uh, systems, uh, so such as the, the microfinance institutions. I think that was spoken about. Um, we've done a project with a, uh, um, some of the microfinance institutions in Sierra Leone. And what was really important was through them, we were able to get remitters here and others to work right through the chain and um, get people over in Sierra Leone um, to, to get who were f uh, formerly excluded from the financial system, to get them bank accounts um, and, and also training in terms of fi financial literacy. And we need to look at ways that all down the chain you can build capacity as well. And you know, I, I guess the, the other key thing that I wanted to stress was the point that uh, Mr. Watkins made about regulation being very, very important part of a kind of a de development agenda, and all of us need to pay more attention to that. But also, in terms of the point that was being made there, that it's really critical that those who are making these remittances have a seat at the table. I mean, the key, the key will be to make sure that development ministers take this seriously. Yeah. You know, we can, we can persuade as much as we like, but uh, development ministers yeah. should make remittances a core development issue. Yeah. Uh, and that's really what we should be arguing for. Um, and it, I, I think it's an open door if, if yeah. we're able to put the right kind of pressure on. Um, and you know, one thing that occurs to me is is that nobody's mentioned the role of the European Union in this either, because all the all the the legislation that's going through there now on on banking on on these issues that we've been discussing today really do need to be looked at. So I would urge um, ODI to to take a, a look at that and to see what can be done to ensure that the legislation that's now been discussed by the Commission can include this very important issue. And also, how do we get the G8 to act on this one as well? So we need to just pull in all of these different factors and make sure that we lobby and work together to, to, to make things happen. Because what today's about is, how do we unlock the potential that remittances, ha remittances have? Because we haven't done that yet. Uh, so that's the challenge. Please, you want to come, come in? No, I fully agree with you. Uh, um, it's a development issues and there's uh, the other day I was watching News Tonight and they were talking about aid and, and I know UK people are, are, are getting bit, at least some member of the parliament, they don't want more aid. Well, if you <laughs> reduce remittance, go, not going to the countries, then you'll have to provide more aid mm. to those development countries. This is one way to stop aid coming from the Western world, <laughs> is to allow mm. people to help themselves, to set up businesses, to, to set up trade, to you know, be independent. So, so this is one way, and I agree with you. The European Parliament and uh, the UK Parliament, and at least we are in the UK now. The UK government, I have to say, ten years ago, thirty years ago, were supporting the remittance issue. Mm. It, it, I mean, Dr. Dilba, I met him two thousand three through a London conference. It was different who were leading the whole thing. Yeah. It was the, you know, but the moment it seems to be the UK is going the other way around, mm. unless it come back to it, and in, you know. Uh, 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 find a solution where uh, cheapest, secure uh, channels can be sent money through the remote area and Western area and money are not the answer. They don't send to everywhere. They don't send to remote locations. They, they are, um, I don't want to be that negative towards them, but we need more competition, but the government and regulation has a role to play to, to bring that. Thank you, and we'll finish there, and there's, there's tea and coffee outside, and then we're very late for the next panel. So now we need to all realise that what we've got to do is go away and mo mobilise support for really urgent reform and put remittances on the agenda. So that's the message from these like, two panels, I think, and we all need to make sure we don't forget them. Thank you. Thank you.